to the Q&A session. My name's Kate McCarthy and I'm with the Northwest Local Land Services. And I'll just put my screen up. Um, so hopefully you can see my screen. So yeah, welcome to, welcome to the Q&A on effective grazing management. Um, I'd just like to know where, you, where you're listening in from today. If you wanna pop in the comments box where you might be listening in from, that'd be great just to, to see where you all are. Um, so essentially there's a little photo of me, if you can see the screen. I'm the one in the middle with some colleagues um, at a tropical pastures day at Tamworth um, Agricultural Institute, um, just behind a, some um, digit and roads grass, I think there. So um, anyway, yeah, my name's Kate McCarthy um, with the Northwest Local Land Services as a livestock officer. And today I'm just gonna touch on um, effective grazing management and what's involved. So I guess in most instances, the aim as a, as a producer, well, in most, for most people is to, uh, you know, increase the amount of kilograms per hectare produced in the most cost efficient way. So increase the amount of kilograms of animal product produced per hectare. And that generally requires effective, the ability to effectively convert pastures into product. And in order to achieve this, there's a number of variables that must be considered in, in grazing management. So today I'll um, aim to go over the main components of, of grazing management. And a lot of these principles are derived from um, a pro-graze course, which I'll talk about in a minute. But um, yeah, I'm gonna talk about pasture assessments. I'm gonna talk about quantity and quality of pastures and what, what's involved in that. And I'm also gonna talk about how we, we put, it, um, put it all into practice and, and what that looks like. So um, starting off, pasture assessments. Pasture assessments are an excellent tool to allow you to understand how much kilograms of dry matter you have available in a paddock. And a key reason to do a pasture assessment is that it allows you to ensure the nutrient requirement of the animals can be met through pasture production. So I guess like with pa pasture assessments, this information is really important because it then allows you to gu guide the establishment of things such as feed plans, and it allows you to ensure you're maintaining that critical ground cover. So you probably see in the screen there, there's there's a fair bit of legume available and that that's almost 100% ground cover with 100% green. So um, if you are interested in, in um, knowing more how to do a pasture assessment, the logistics, um, ProGraze is an excellent course. We'll actually be running some once the COVID um, the COVID restrictions are all allow us to do so. So if you are interested, um, please let, let us know um, or send me an email. That would be great because yeah, we'll go over a lot of these components in that course. But essentially, yeah, a, a pasture assessment involves estimating the quantity of pasture available or the herbage mass to allow you to work out the kilograms of dry matter per hectare. So I guess there's various ways of doing this and some more technical than others. Um, but yeah, so if you are interested in learning about the more technical element of it, highly re recommend um, the course. But I, say, I guess the reason that we're talking kilograms of dry matter per hectare is that dry matter is the key component that we think of when we're looking at nutrition. I said like, I suppose water doesn't have any nu nutrient value for livestock. So we always work on a dry matter basis because that's where they're getting the energy and protein, et cetera, and fiber from. So there's a couple of really important factors um, that we incorporate into herbage, uh, sorry, into pasture assessments. And when we talk pasture assessments or pasture, we, we often talk in um, the, the term of herbage mass, which I probably didn't mention before. And these factors are height, density, and dry matter, as I mentioned before. So we'll talk about this in a little bit, but all of these factors impact things such as digestibility and the quality and quantity of the pasture that's available. So, Quantity and quality, quantity and quality. Why? Why is it? Why is it important? Um, I suppose before we delve into quantity and quality, if I can say it correctly, um, I just wanted to go over intake. And and I suppose intake's probably it, it's something that's really important to both of those things, because if they're not getting enough, 
or they're getting too much and it's being impacted by digestibility, it's going to impact production. So essentially intake is influenced by what the animal can physically eat and what's available in the paddock. So fiber, fiber is something that, we, that really um, impacts digestibility and it pay, plays a key role in how much an animal can eat. And I suppose we've mentioned this before and if you've listened to any of our What the Wednesdays, we talk about this, but um, the way that you find out how di uh, digestible your um, pasture is or how much fiber is available is through getting a feed test done and once you've got a feed test, there's a figure that comes up and it's called the NDF percentage or the neutral detergent fibre, and it's related to digestibility. So what it is, is that it's a percentage of, it's, it's shown as a percentage, and essentially it'll impact how much that animal can consume. So I suppose, you know, digestibility, similar to if we eat a highly fibrous you know, bed, bread that's full of fiber, whole grain, that the, it's meant to, you know, slow digestion and we're able to process it because it's more fibrous. It's the same principle. The, the higher digest, sorry, the, the more digestible something is, um, the, the, I guess the better that animal is able to consume that particular pasture and the less digestible it is, it slows down the process. Anyway, we'll talk about that in a bit. So with the NDF percentage, if you want to know how, um, you know, how much that animal can and eat from a particular pasture, I've done a little example. Thank you. Um, I've done a little example. And the example is if you just had 300 kilogram steers um, and you wanted them to grow at one kilogram a day. So um, just say a recent feed test came back for a pasture and it's saying that the NDF percentage is 72 and the megajoules of metabolizable energy is 8.3. So um, I guess from there, what you say is that for those animals to grow at one kilogram a day, they need to have 73 megajoules of metabolizable energy to, to achieve that one kilogram growth. So are they going to get enough energy from that pasture? I guess, are they going to, sorry, are they going to eat enough to be able to get enough energy from that pasture. So from the NDF percentage, what you would do is that you would typically put that 70, 120 over that 72%, and that would show you that that animal is able to eat 1.6% of their body weight in that pasture, which is about 4.8 kilograms. But to get enough energy that they require for the day, they would roughly need to eat about 8.7 kilograms to get that 73 megajoules of energy. So <clears throat> this is where we talk about how fibre can impact how much energy they can get and how much they can consume. So um, I'm going to ask if anyone has any questions um, from that point. Um, if you have any questions, just shoot them through in the comment box on anything that I've mentioned so far. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll keep moving on if there isn't any. So um, the next thing we're going to talk about is quality. So quality is just important as quantity, and it's it's where you you start talking about the contents of energy, protein, fiber, etc. So you probably already know, but energy is classified in megajoules of metabolizable energy, um, and then you also talk about components of protein and then fiber and all of these drive production and they're associated with quality of pastures. So, <clears throat> but digestibility, digestibility is very important when we start talking about grazing pastures. And I suppose, as I mentioned before, it links to that. So digestibility is expressed as a percentage and it's the proportion of plant matter that is retained in the animal's body after digestion. And that essentially tells you how effectively that plant matter will be processed. So this is an image that we like, just gives you a bit of an example. So just say the pasture that your um, cattle are grazing is around 70% digestible. Just say they eat 10 kilograms of that pasture per day. They're going to retain seven kilograms. 70% of that pasture is what they retain. 30% or three kilograms is going to go out in... Um, in dung or feces. So this is a um, an image from the ProGraze manual and describes how digestibility works essentially. Um, 
So it will impact how much food they can take in a day. And one thing to note is that digestibility does differ between pasture species and as well as it differs between what stage of growth that particular pasture is at. So our next image, which is also derived from the ProGraze manual, gives you a really good idea as to how what's what particular point so if we're talking about tropicals at the moment tropicals have sort of get to they're at the point where they've they've hit their reproductive their seeding um they're definitely past like vegeta um vegetation vegetative stage and they're starting to dry off so if we put that as an example if you match if you start matching off dry grass and leaf and then you match it up on that curve and look at its digestibility we're looking at roughly between that 50% mark to 45% as a, as a rough. Obviously, this differs and it's only an example, but as a rough estimate, you're looking at that 50%. So, and then from the energy side of things, if you match it up across there, you're looking at probably around six megajoules on, of energy that they can retain from that particular, that pasture. So that's really important to keep in mind when you're thinking about grazing pastures. And as you move from summer active plants to winter active plants, be mindful when their peak production stage is and where they are at with vegetation and flowering because that will impact digestibility. So the next um, slide that we're going to cover on is quantity. So this little image here is an image of a, of a nice gumboot and it's showing essentially a little rule of thumb is roughly three centimetres equates to about 1,000 kilograms of dry matter. Sorry, I didn't put that in the presentation. And every two centim every centimetre after that is another 200 kilograms of dry matter. So essentially when we talk about quantities, we, we really delve into the herbage mass component and it's kilograms of dry matter per hectare. And it's essentially, you know, what what how, what density of pasture there's available and will that quantity in the paddock be enough to meet how much that lives your livestock need so i guess um this is yeah like i said with the boot um you can there's a couple of ways of taking it but this is a bit of a you know a rough paddock of um estimate for take looking at pasture quantity and they say like yeah the heel of the boot is about three centimeters and that's when you can look across the paddock and, and assume that you'd probably have around a thousand kilograms of dry matter per hectare, and then every two every centimetre taller is another two hundred kilograms as a rough estimate. Estimate, but remember, dry matter differs between species. So we're just talking about the dry matter component. We're not talking about the water component, and it differs, especially for example, tropicals have a higher water content. So you have to take that into consideration. But if you just want a, a rough rule of thumb blink of the eye what have i got in the paddock this is a bit of a good tool um and i suppose how quantity can impact production is that um i suppose animals have different grazing behaviors and obviously their bites are a little bit different but for example if you had a low herbage mass pasture but it was high in digestibility so remember, digestibility means that it's, it can be it can take in a lot more, means that it can eat a lot more. Um, but if it's a low herbage mass and that that quantity isn't there, then that impacts that will negative Im, negatively impact how much um, how many impact intake. Sorry, because the animal can only take small bites. But if you look at it on a different scale, if you had high herbage mass, so you had a lot of quantity. And then you had really poor digestibility so that that food moves through that animal really slowly you're also going to have um, intake limited due to the amount of time it's taken to to digest it so that's a little bit on that um does anyone have any questions about that yep feed yeah okay so we've had a question come in how often should you do a feed test i don't think you know if you're taking a feed test, season seasons, I think seasons are really important for feed tests for pastures. So if you, we just go back to that, um, go back to that image that I was talking about before here. So if you wanted to estimate, obviously we're coming into the later part of 
um, we're nearly obviously in the cool period. Our tropicals are, are starting to um, lose their potential or their peak production. But, you know, sometimes it's it's that's theoretical. If you really want to know what's in your paddock, you take a feed test. So, you know, moving towards the more cooler periods, if you want to know what your if you've sown oats and you want to know what they're providing to your animals if you're grazing them already, great time to take a feed test. If you're concerned about your animals losing weight and they're grazing in pasture, great time to take a feed test because it gives you a quantitative quantitative measurement of what's in the paddock rather than taking a stab in the dark and thinking, right, oh, I think I've got this, I think I've got this, I'm going to, oh, maybe this is, are they going to put on this amount of weight? If you can specify how much is available, it will show you how much energy is available, how much protein is available, how, di how digestible that pasture is. Then you can really make it a, um, a good good um, estimate of what, what can be available for your animals to grow. So, yeah. Base it on seasons, base it on production periods. So where, you know, where the, if you've got cows that are about to calve or anything like that, and you really want to be precise with your pasture intake, great time to, to do so. So um, moving on from that. <laughs> um, my, the thing that, sorry, the thing that I'll um, talk about and where it all sort of links in is, is why should you use grazing manage management as a strategy? And essentially, sorry, essentially grazing management has a lot of key benefits aside from the fact that it allows you to maintain um, ground cover, which is really essential because if you had that 70% ground cover available in your paddocks, <clears throat> then you minimise the risk of erosion, you minimise the risk of runoff, and you retain the, the water that you're getting from rain a lot better. So that's one of the main reasons. But another reason, sorry, is it allows you to effectively manage your pastures. <clears throat> and one thing that's important is that with, with your pastures, if you are able to, to keep them in that key growing period, so, creek, so key growing length, then you keep them in their most productive stage, I guess, the best that you can. Going back to that image, as soon as they start flowering, then you're, re you're reducing the quality that's available in that pasture. And another thing is it allows your paddocks to recover. So grazing management gives your paddocks an opportunity to recover based on the calculations that you've done on how long it's going to last or how many animals I can put in that paddock for a certain period of time. So I guess... Another thing to consider with strategies of grazing management is animals have, uh, livestock have different grazing management behaviours. So sheep and cattle are a little bit different. Um, sheep will graze closer to the ground and compared to cattle and are probably more likely to select for green material. Whereas cattle, they'll just go for the, they'll remove dry, dry feed a lot easier and um, especially like without any issue if it's poor in quality. So that's something to be mindful when you're, when you're looking at strategies that sheep will graze it to the, the bare ground. Um, but I suppose, yeah, so with grazing management, there's obviously different systems. And one thing that I'll say is that with the, if, if you are or you, you're already doing it or you're thinking about doing it, with picking a system, whether it be, you know, set stocking, rotational grazing, cell grazing, time control grazing, anything like that, make sure that it suits your enterprise and your time management because some of these require that bit of time to either move pad move stock through paddocks um, and be just keeping on top of where they are in the especially if it's rotational or cell etc so that's something that i'll say about um, grazing management is to make sure it suits your enterprise um, but what it does is all these things that i've talked about can kind of can kind of lead into a feed budget and you can either make that feed budget fit into your um, grazing strategy. So, um, for example, you could sort of set up a rotational grazing um, strategy and then say, well, look, roughly these paddocks are going to last this amount of days, so I'm aiming to rotate it on a, you know, that sort of basis. So I've got a little example here, and this is an example, and again, this is um, probably it's derived from ProGraze, which I'll say again is a really excellent course for these sort of stuff, but um, a similar, so sorry, it's a similar example to what is there available. So if we've, um, you know, you, 
you're thinking, right, okay, I've got this information and I want to put, you know, for example, I want to put 200, a mob of 250 lambing ewes into a paddock, a 30 hectare paddock, and I want to know how long or how many days it will last. And it, is it going to suit their, um, I guess, is it going to suit their um, production needs? So I haven't taken into account energy or digestibility or anything like that um, with this particular uh, example. And it's also a, at a paddock level. So I haven't taken into account DSE or anything like that. This is just a rough bit of a feed plan. So a producer wants to know he has a mob of 250 um, lambing ewes in a 30 hectare paddock. The intended stocking density is 12.5 ewes per hectare. So you roughly work that out <clears throat> at around, yeah, 200, yeah, uh, sorry, yeah, 200, sorry, 12.5 12, 12 ewes per hectare, if I can talk clearly. And then for, from those ewes, they have a, an intake of roughly 2.7 kilograms per head per day. So that's how much they're going to take in daily. So if you work that up to their intake per hectare, that's roughly around 37, 33.7 kilograms. So then you go, right, well, my pasture is expected to grow at about 20 kilograms um, of dry matter per hectare per day. So just say we're talking about, I don't know, at oats or something like that, just for example, that would probably be something uh, uh, they probably have a higher growth rate at the moment. But um, and then this particular producers looked and said, well, there's currently 1700 kilograms of green available in, in the paddock and they don't want that that paddock to diminish any lower than 1200 kilograms of green. So they don't want the animals to graze at any lower than that. Um, so you would say, right, okay, there's a 500 kilogram surplus of feed available for those used to graze without impacting the pastures and um, themselves. So essentially the ewes are eating 33.7 kilograms per hectare per day, but the pastures, um, the, pa the pastures only growing at 20 kilograms, there's a little typo, sorry. So the net herbage mass is 13.7 kilograms. So then you can roughly work out that there's 36 grazing days available in that paddock for those ewes. Now that's not going to particularly last a lambing period. So that's when you go, okay, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a rotational grazing strategy. That paddock can only last that long. I'll aim to move it by then. That's a really long grazing period, but that's one particular way. But you'd start looking at the options where you can sort of manage that situation for those particular animals. But just doing this as a rough little run of the mill, um, you know, piece of paper uh, feed plan gives you an idea as to how you can sustainably manage that particular pasture in that paddock. So that's, that's pretty much all that I've got um, in that regards today. Um, do we have any more questions? Um, so I probably, yeah, as a question, is there anything at the moment that people are sort of looking or, you know, what is what have a lot of people got in for winter, for f moving towards the winter feed gap? Um, have people got strategies in place for that or are they grazing, a lot of people grazing oats or that sort of thing? And, um, yeah, so that's probably one thing I'll ask people is, is what, are you, what are you grazing at the moment and what are you looking to fill that winter feed gap with? Yeah, so um, is there anything? No. Well, if people do shoot that through to me, then, yeah, I'll be able to um, answer those, obviously, through um, message or we'd be able to get, th get back to you through Facebook. But, yeah, if you have anything else that's, um, even if it's not related to grazing strategies, please feel free to um, send us a message through Facebook. Um, if you want to send me an email, um, I'm sure it's up. It's available on our Facebook page through um, our various What the Wednesdays, which are also a really great resource. Um, I'd again remind you about the ProGrace course that we'll intend to run after the whole COVID thing, so keep an eye on that. And um, thank you for listening in. We really appreciate your time to, to listen into those things and hope, hope it's been of value to you. And um, we look forward to seeing you at our next Q&A. So thank you.